Uh, so now, can we good? Yeah. So if you can go to the next slide, uh, then it would be easier. Um, So thank you. Yeah. So I was just thinking to have a bit of technological advancement that we are sitting too far away around like almost how much the difference? I don't know how much, but it's a two hour difference from the timing itself. And we are in the Northern Hemisphere and you, uh, we are in the Southern Hemisphere and you, you are in the Northern Hemisphere. So, um, this advancement in technology that we can discuss these things too far away from each other, but we are close, as close as we are facing each other. So can you get to the next slide? Yeah. So this presentation is actually based uh, what the, uh, Asad has actually requested me. So we have actually both of them, absolute measurement for photon beam using the farmer type chambers. Basically, this is a reference dosimetry for photons and the reference dosimetry for electrons. Um, they, are, they don't use any more absolute terms. The absolute terms is actually is not uh, relevant anymore. So they previously they used the absolute term, but now they are using um, uh, reference dosimetry. So another one is actually on the electrons, which we can discuss. We can discuss after the end of the meeting. So as uh, Manoj has uh, said, that we can discuss this thing uh, when we are going to the next session. So yeah, can you go to the next slide, please? Um, okay. Okay. So let me, I think so my, okay. Okay, my, just a second. Just a minute. My office, office is working, so. Okay, that's fine. So now I can load, I can load. Can you close this one so I can upload my one? So then it will be easier for me. Yeah, that's it. So hi, you can go here. And then just a second. Close. Uh, how you can share the screen, uh, share the screen. Okay, yes, this one, share, okay. Okay, so uh, today we just concentrating on most of the um, photon dosimetry uh, in water. So the, basically, if you going for the photon dosimetry, the what the TRS-3981 discuss about, you know, you have to be very careful about the phantoms as well. So there are a few recommendations from the TRS-3981. So what should be the size of the phantom and how much the, you know, what the distance from the edge of the field, how much is the edge of the field distance from should be at least five centimeter you have from the edge of the field. So you can get the, uh, proper scatter conditions. Otherwise, if you don't have this one, the, 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 this is the minimum requirement basically. And if you don't, if you have less than that, your scatter condition will not meet the TRS-398 recommendations. Um, and uh, the- Your slides are not moving. Not moving? Yes, it's not moving. Oh, okay, interesting. So can I stop sharing and then share again? Okay, it's sharing now, it's, it's moving now? Uh, yes, it's uh, Change the slide first. Yeah. Yes, it's now moving, yes. Okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, that's what I was saying that the, what the minimum phantom requirements are there. So uh, you, you, I just mentioned it here a bit of, five centimeter at least. And on the bottom, the ground from the, you know, the point, the position of the chamber to the bottom of the phantom should be at least 10 centimeter recommendations for the higher energies. But if you have like a four M MB or like a six MB, you can have like five to eight centimeter as well. But 
mostly recommended 10 centimeter in TRS-399 and TG-51. So, so there are some uh, different phantoms, which is actually substitute of water. What the construction of them, and there are as a beautiful uh, explanation is given in the TRS-398. If you go to page 40, you can find all this information there. So they have like a, they, they try to make it the electron density equivalent to the water that they can use this material as a water equivalent material. So, and you have understand that the actual value and the, um, uh, those uh, distribution on the basis of the Hounsfield units. So this is what they are trying to make it water equivalent actual value, which is, should be this close to that. And then they can get a similar uh, result as you can get the result in water, but slightly different. It's not always like you have to find the fat factor for that. That is most of the, you can see that most of the um, uh, plastic water are not exactly water equivalent. And if you are wanna do the precise, uh, uh, you know, uh, reference dosimetry, you should be careful. You can have to do the comparison between the water and then the solid water. You do, it, you get the output in, uh, water and then same time you do the output in the solid water and then compare and see what the difference you get it and then this is your basically called a fudge factor uh, if you if, if you want to do it but there is a lots of issue with the other things especially when you're doing electron dosimetry uh, you can't get the precise uh, 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 you know the depth which is a d max maybe if like for example if you can go up to one millimeter if it's less than like if you are getting uh, your your depth is 1.54 milli you know, centimeters you can't get you can get only 1.5 you can't get 1.54 so but in water you can do all these things because you can adjust the uh, chamber uh, position by up to uh, less than a 0.1 of a millimeter most of the good water fans they can up to go to 0.1 of a millimeter um there are um uh, yeah. So if you um, going for reference dosimetry, the most important bit is actually you have to select the proper chamber. So there are a few uh, good recommendations in um, TRS-277-381, IEC-60731. So they are the standard. If you go there, you can find all the standard definitions. What is the best solution for the uh, and it's also a bit of uh, information is given in the uh, phantom uh, sorry photon chapters where they talk about the reference dosimetry of photons uh, i think it's a chapter six in trs398 so they have a bit of in, uh, information but if you want to go really deep in to understand that which is the best optimal um uh, reference dosimetry chamber they you you can read you, you, you it's good to refer these TRS 277 or 381 or uh, IEC is actually the best document as well. So they, they, I just summarized a little bit here. So these are the summary of that. So you can have, have at least 0.1 cc to 1 cc for reference dosimetry and internal diameter not motor, not greater than seven centimeter, seven millimeter. Internal diameter mean like at a thimble, if you have a thimble chamber, so then the internal diameter not more than seven millimeters. Uh, the length should it should be um, not greater than 25 mils, like at the length of the chamber from the tip to the, um, you know what I mean. So construction should be homogeneous as possible, but you can't be have a homogeneous as well because you have to use, there's an air cavity and then the electrode as well, which is a metallic. So... Yes. Sorry, I... Me, sorry, I couldn't hear you, please. Can you repeat? Okay, can you hear me now? Uh, yes, sir, you can continue. Okay, air cavity is not sealed. Uh, and this is called the vented chamber. So that's why we have to, uh, okay, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> I don't wanna, there's a one question coming soon. Uh, well, a wall should be made of the graphite. This is the most recommended one, but there's also be the waterproof sleeve. They normally put it on the top of it. And the recommendation for these sleeves, not more than one millimeter thick. Uh, so normally it is around 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 of a millimeters in, in normal uh, thingy. 
So the there are the you know the selection of the chamber calibration. So former chamber calibrated or cross calibrated at the reference uh, beam quality cobalt sixty, which is normally we use it uh, for reference osimetry, or the direct beam calibration under the user beam quality, uh, which is normally uh, is not very commonly available. But uh, we are lucky here in Australia that we have this uh, uh, PSD PSL PSL PSDL lab, which can primary second primary standard dosimeter lab, which give us a, a direct beam quality. So I will discuss. Uh, there are the one of the slide I have actually discussed about the how you want to calculate the if it is the direct beam calibration. So the cross uh, the calibrated or cross calibrated at the reference dosimetry uh, the beam quality, which is the part one, which I'm just going. We normally have it in um, Pakistan. So we normally, our chamber is calibrated at SSDL lab, which is based on the cobalt 60. So what we do actually, the normally calibrated chamber is actually from the, you, you get it. The, yeah, there are a few um, reference I'm just giving you to you. Australian, uh, that's what I told you that we can get the direct mean calibration. And the chamber then cross calibrated in a local reference chamber, or uh, you can use the direct, if you want to use the direct beam calibrated chamber from the, the SSDL lab, either you can do in house. You get the, your reference chamber from the from the uh, which is calibrated at SSDL, and then you do the cross calibration at home, uh, in a home institution, and then use as a uh, routine works because normally uh, this is what the normal practices are because they send a one chamber uh, to. Um, to you, your you know lab and then they will when it's come you do the cross calibration for all other chambers with the reference chambers which has come from SSEL lab or uh, you can use directly if, if because it's not very expensive in, in in Pakistan but in here in Australia it's really expensive it costs you like around like something ten thousand something around ten thousand dollars which is really a big amount of money so so that's why we normally do the cross calibration. And you can use the TRS398 or TG51 for the cross calibration. So the most, when you are doing a reference dosimetry, so the reference uh, setup is actually very important. So this is the um, structure information. I'm just giving a bit of information here. So what normally we use, anyone know why we use 10 by 10 field size for our uh, reference dosimetry? Is anyone has any idea? Is if they, they can put in a comment, and um, so we can we can discuss a bit at the end of this present uh, this slide. So uh, at the center of the we effective point of measurements for the chamber we normally put at the center. So does anyone know why we do not correct the effective point of measurement using the, when we are doing a reference uh, dosimetry? So this is another question for you guys. So. <clears throat> The third one is uh, PTD. Sorry. Sorry, I said what happened? Uh, so you can continue, sir. No way. Okay. So beam quality, uh, the other thing is actually the beam quality. Beam quality, you can use the TPR2010 or PTD methods. So there are both methods, you can use it. But there are uh, the issue with the, um, sorry, I just missed it. This should be coming up. Go back. So here is, uh, when you do the TPR 2010s, you don't have to be worried about much, but when you are doing a PTDs methods, so you should be using this formalism to get your TPR 2010s. And uh, in TG51, the, they recommend if you are doing a PTDs using to get your beam quality, so you should be make sure that you are avoiding the electron contaminations. But if you're doing electron contamination, if, if you're doing a PTD method, you should be avoiding the contamination, electron contamination. So this is normally what they recommend. You should be using um, something lead uh, foil to, 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 to avoid the electron contaminations in the TD51. I think so most of them, you are aware of that. But if you don't do it, then the difference in your dosimetry, I, I think it's around 0.2% or 0.1%. 1% roughly, I depend depend on the energy as well. So if the energy is increased, it is increased. 
PDD to point the TPR 2010. So this is the other things. There are two methods. You can use the plane parallel ionization chamber, uh, which is normally the recommended chamber, or you can use the, you know, uh, uh, you know the um, uh, symbol chamber, but you have to correct the effective point of measurement for the both of them if you are using a TPR a PDD method. So these are the informations, and you can use the lead foil to avoid the electron contamination, which I actually discussed. There's a very good, uh, beautiful paper has been written by the uh, Roger in 1995. So you can read through, and it will give you an information why we are using a lead lead foil to avoid the electron contaminations in it. So. Uh, oh, sorry. I don't know how you can make this one minimize it. Okay, so, <clears throat> uh, so anyone may be aware of the why not we correct the ion recombination and polarity effect when we using a TPR 2010 method measurements, and why we are when we doing a TPR method 2010. Is anyone know why we are not correcting uh, our effective point of measurements in doing a TPR 2010. I think that should be coming in the in the in the in this one and the next few slides. So setup continues. Okay. So the field size is defined as the surface of the phantom for the SSD setup. Whereas the SAD setup, we normally use the SAD setup most of the center. Uh, but in few centers, they can use they use they are using a SSD method. Uh, like in Shipa was using SSD method, as I remember when I was there. So why 10 centimeter depth is recommended, but most Linux are calibrated at Dmax. Does anyone know that? So put your comment in the uh, in the in the in the comments section. So just put your answer in the comment sections. Um, this is the basically the details why is the why we use the 10 centimeter depth. So the TPR. 2010 measurements is actually what we do. Actually, we put your um, chamber at 10 centimeter depth, so which is the field size 10 by 10, and then <clears throat> this is 90 10, and then you change your uh, you don't move your chamber. The chamber will be remain same there, and you just increase the depth of the water. So and then you change. The SSD to 80 and depth of the chamber is 20. So the, the ratio of these two, you get the answer for the for your uh, for your uh, TPR 2010, the beam quality. So so this is what we do actually. Uh, that's what we're asking you why we do not correct effective point of measurements when we're doing a measurement of a TPR 2010, which is um, is a very uh, common question for the exams. If you are doing a IPE, MBC exams, or maybe I ACP, SCM exams, so the, <clears throat> these are the very common uh, questions they normally ask you in the interview. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, TPR twenty ten measurements using the PDI with cylindrical chambers. So what happened? Actually, you put your chamber. And you have to correct your effective point of measurements. So, does anyone know why? Uh, why does the PT, PDI can be used as a PDD in PT fifty one or TRS three nine eight for the for the photon beam? Because what we measuring it is not a PDD; is a percentage depth ionization curve. What we use for the if you're using a in a far you know simple chamber are you using a um, parallel plate chambers in both cases so the 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 position of the uh, sorry the um the the curve which we get is called percentage depth ionization curve is not the percentage depth dose curve so either we can use this curve as a percentage depth dose or are we have to convert it back to pdds so this is another question for your exams. This is very common question they ask you. So they are, there is a that ref, the specific reference step, which is normally recommend when you are doing a reference dosimetry, what depth you should be putting your uh, chamber at. So they, the TRS-398 and TG-51, both are recommending that you should be putting at, at the depth of 10 centimeter. But in TRS-398, they still, um, uh, they said you can use it at a five centimeter depth, but for the low energies. 
what the low energies mean that the TPR 2010 should be less than 0.7. So then you can use five centimeter, but mostly the most recommended uh, depth is 10 centimeter in both cases. But if you want to use a 10 centimeter, uh, five centimeter depth for your reference dosimetry, when you are doing your reference dosimetry, then you should make sure that your TPR 2010 should be the ratio of this, it should be less than 0.7. If it is greater than seven, you have to have 10 centimeter. You can't do it at five centimeter. So why we use ZRAP? Why not we, could, we can do it on the DMAX? Normally, the, most of the, you know, the variant Linux are like um, Electra Linux are calibrated at DMAX, where your one MU is equal to one centigrade, uh, 100 MU is equal to 100 centigrade at a DMAX. But why we have to use the ZRAP? This is another question. Put your answer in a please comment box. Uh, when you're doing a measurement, so what happened actually, uh, we have to correct. I remember when I was talking about in the in the um, in the beginning slides when we in, in especially when we start the setup and we have said that the chamber R should be vented chamber. The vented chamber means we have to correct the temperature and pressures. Do you know why we have to correct the temperature and pressures if it is a vented chamber? And what is the law? Which law it's is a fact to on your on, on your signal if you don't correct your signal and uh, how much it it will affect on your reading for example if you don't correct for temperature and pressure how much the factor should be so it's like two percent three percent four percent five percent can you put your answer in your comments so this is what i asked you and the other thing is actually the polarity correction factors so do we need to correct the reading for the polarity why we have to correct it? Because if, for example, if your chamber in, in cobalt 60 is calibrated at minus 300, so you can use this minus 300 and then you get on, uh, get the answer. But why do you have to do for the two different polarities and get the uh, get your uh, correction factor for polarity? And similarly, why, why we, we use the three mi minimum voltage ratio for the, for the, for the recombinations? The ratio mean mean to say, for example, you're doing at 400 and 100 are 300 are 100. The ratio of 300 and 100 is three. So why why we should use three minimum voltage ratio for recombination? Why not we can use like 200 and 100 or 300 and 200? You know, so you have to be understand that. Please put your answer in your comment box. Um, another thing, actually, your um, uh, electric K elect, which is a um, electrometer recombin electrometer factor, because normally what happened when you send your chamber for calibration, normally these chambers are calibrated in a one single as a one single package. So electrometer and your chamber are as a one package. So this is calibrated together. And if it is calibrated together, you don't have to correct it. But if it is calibrated separately, then you have to correct it. So I give the one of the answer to you guys. So temperature and pressures. So before, during, and end, this is what the recommended uh, things. You should be doing it when you are measuring your output because it takes while to settle down the temperatures. You have to take at least 20 minutes to be settled down 20. What the CRC 98 recommends 30 minutes to be stabilize the room temperature, you put your chamber into the water and leave it for 30 minutes, and then you can do the a thing. But if you're not doing it, you can do it before, during, and at the end, and then took the average of it. So, so P0 and T0 are taken from the calibration certificate. So do you know why, why we have to take the reference temperature and pressure in from the calibration certificate. Anyone knows that? Please put your answer in comment box. So this is what I was talking about, the polarity, why we have to correct for polarity, you know, plus 300 and minus 300. And this is what, anyone know which value we should be calculate the polarity effect? The, the bottom one, when you're doing a 
minus 300 and plus 300. Do you know which M? This is plus 300 or minus 300? We should be using it. Anyone knows what, which one we should be using and why? And what it should be? Okay, so there is a recombination as discussed about already. So this is a minus 300 and minus 100. Either we can use 300 and minus 100. Okay, we, another one is actually the which value of the lactometer we use for MB2, which is the bottom one. Anyone knows that? Which one we should use? Or minus 300 or 100? Um, value of A0, A1, and AR, these ones are actually given in the published literature, TTTRS in it, as well as you can find it in our um, TG51 as well. So another thing is actually, you see this polynomial function here. So why we use polynomial function to correct the recombinations? And it also is a second order polynomial. Why we have to do the second order as well? So why not we can use the first order or the fourth order? So the beam quality uh, factor, which we have discussed is in the TRC9, it is given in, and similarly TG51, I don't remember what the table number is, but you can find these ones. Um, KQ, Q0 depends on the TPR 2010 values. So these are the uh, tables in TRC9, and which, for example, if you get like 5.6, for, for example, if you are doing one of the, uh, is any example, no, it's not even. For example, you are having a NE2515 and your TPR 2010 for 6MB is between 6.6 to 4. So how you can calculate 0.62 and 0.65, you took the linear interpolation and then calculate it. Either is, that's what the TRS398 and TG51 says, you can use it as a linear interpolation. But the best thing is actually, you should plot this one in your graph and see the best, you know, that when you plot the graph, use the fitting curve and see the formula there and use this formula to use, to, to, to get your uh, uh, KQQ naught from that, rather than using this, using the linear interpolation. But TRS398 and TG51 says you can use it as a um, uh, uh, linear interpolation for calculating. If it is in between, um, if, you, if the number is in between the two numbers. So. Chamber calibration factors, which is a NDWQ naught for cobalt 60. You get it, this one uh, is a cobalt 60 calibration reference chamber, which is normally you get it from SSDL. Um, uh, other you can do it in local calibration as well, in-house. So when we cross calibrate the field chamber against the PSDL, our SSDL is calibrated reference chamber with 6 MV photon beam. Do you know this cross calibrated factor of field chamber based on cobalt 60 or a 6 MV? Anyone can answer that. Please uh, put your answer in the comment box. Do, do we need to correct the NDWQ naught for polarity and recombination? If yes, then please explain why. Because when you get the chamber calibrated from SSDL or PSDL, the question I was just repeating it, then it comes with the calibration, with the polarity and recombination factor as well. So do you have to correct your NDWQ naught factor for the polarity and recombination of cobalt 60 or not? And if not, why? Or if yes, why? The formalism is for 6 MeV is that which is we discussed and 18 MeV. The NDWQ naught will be remain constant in both. Either you're using 6 MV or 18 MV. So do you think we should have a different calibration factor for each photon energy like 6 MV and uh, 18 MV? Do you think that it should be NDW Q, Q naught factor should be different or the same? So the part two is actually, we discuss about the direct beam calibration. So I'm actually going in good, I think half an hour. 
So, okay, direct beam calibration under the user beam quality. So what it happened, the PSDL give you a certificate, certificate, calibration certificate, which is, is like that, is give you the cobalt 60 absorbed dose, which is give you a NDW Q naught factor, NDW factor, sorry, NDW factor for four, whatever you get it like here. And then they give you the uncertainty associated to that, whatever. The next, the, on the table four, you can see it here, the, here you can see, the four, they, they give you the potent energies and they give you the KQ naught factors for each particular energies. They said whatever the beam quality of the TPR 2010, they have 0.673. The measured KQ is 0.987 and the uncertainty in here. And the similar for 10 MB, they have this and the 18 MB, they have this. So what they do actually, they plot this TPR 2010s, 6, 10 and 18 based on their beam quality as, as you see here and the cobalt 60 as well. So the cobalt 60 is here. So they plot all this together and they give you a fitting curve here, which is they plotted. So they give you the KQ, KQ, as, a, KQ as, 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 a, as a formula and they solve this equation for a, these constants. I think so you have all done in your BSc for, uh, solving for the constant, isn't it, remember? So they, they get these values for these constants. So they give you all this information. So you just have to do what you have to do. You get your TPR 2010, whatever your TPR 2010, put in this formula, was in this formula, and put this constant value, and you get your KQ. This is called the direct beam calibration. And, the, and, and it can reduce your uncertainty about around 0.1%. From if you're using the TRS-398 table, which we have discussed previously here and uh, here, sorry, here, this will almost give you almost 1% as, as is calculated by, because this is both, they done it, they have done it for the number of the times and then they get the consensus data for that one is actually, and uh, sorry, the, the, is, is a Monte Carlo calculator one. Sorry, these are the Monte Carlo calculated uh, beam quality factors. So what you do actually, you just get this one KQ and you apply this TPR 20 then here, whatever the TPR, for example, you get 0.679. Just put it here and you put the TPR value, uh, A, the, these constant values, and then you multiply or solve this equation and you get your KQ. So what happened when you have a triple F beams, what is, what is the difference in the, in the um, uh, triple F beam if you are using the triple F beam? So what has happened? So only the difference in the, in the signal at the chamber because your, your beam profile is actually, have you seen the beam profile for the triple F? Is anyone seen? I think so it's, it's um, I just draw it for you guys quickly. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. So what it do actually, I just put a quickly a new slide for you. So what it look like, if I, you can see my slides? <clears throat> yes, sir, we can see it. Okay. So, I'm just doing a roughly drawing it actually for you guys to just understand the what is uh, what I mean. So what happened actually? Your chamber is um, this is your thimble chamber, for example. So what happened in this? Um, if I don't format. So you can see the signal in this region of the chamber is not uniform. But if you have a flat beam, it will be exactly straight line in this region. So you can get like the flat is like that. So you get, get the flight, flat uh, response of the chamber. But here is the chamber is not exactly flat. So it's actually is, is curved. So in the, in the, in the, sensitive volume of the chamber. So you have to correct this one. So what it do actually, so this is the beautifully written uh, technical note. 
they discuss about the um, this. Um, I can I can let's see, let's see, make it bigger. You can see. Can you see? Okay, so they, they did it actually, and they found it um, uh, additional factor to correct this uniformity correction factors. Have you, is most of them, if any one of you have done the uniform, uniformity correction factor for the, when you're doing an in-air measurement for the uh, brachytherapy uh, air coma calibration? So there is a factor which is called a uniform, uniformity correction factors. So what is uniformity correction factor is, it's because the signal coming, uh, the, 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 the radiation coming from the radio, radioactive source is not uniformly distributed especially when the chamber is almost 2.5 centimeter long. Your, your normally former chambers are 2.4 centimeter long. So this non-uniformity has to be corrected. So this is what they're doing it here, as I showed in, your, in the presentation here. So you can see this, this non-uniformity correction factor is actually accounted here. So that they calculated it. They said that is a 0.6% of the 10 MeV triple F and the 0.3 for six triple F. So, what they do actually, what the 0.3 means, if you are multiplying by 0.997, so you will be correcting for around 0.3% of your signal. So it, it, will, it will account this non-uniformity non, 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 non corrections. If you read this paper, it's really good paper. Uh, and, and if you wanna go a bit more details, there is a TG4, uh, uh, small field dosimetry ones, which is called TG4, TRS, 481, I think, TRS 481, which is recently published for the small field dosimeter. They have talked about this one, uh, the non-uniformity correction factor for the um, triple F beams. So if you correct additional this one, so then you will be getting a proper dose for your particular energies. So thank you very much for listening to me. If you have any question, I'm happy to answer. Uh, thank you very much, uh, sir, for uh, the very informative uh, uh, talk. Uh, sir, we have a few responses uh, yep. from different participants. Yes. Okay, uh, sir, I will share the uh, response of uh, the survey, and okay. you can answer those questions as well. Okay, no problem. Okay. So I'm okay. sharing my window. Okay, please. Uh... I stopped my sharing, so you can share now. So it should be all right. Oh, okay. So the questions are written on the top and the response are given oh, yeah. in the chart form. So you can oh, nice. <laughs> see that. Lovely. Good job, man. Really nice. Looking good. So most of them people are knowing that actually is the um, use of the one millimeter lead is actually reduce the contamination electron contamination that's good this is normally is a trs uh, tg51 protocol if you're using tg51 protocol but if you're using trs398 you don't need to correct it because this is um, only uh, because in trs398 they don't use the pdd methods they use the um, ppr method which i have actually explained in my presentations so you can put the, your chamber at 10 centimeters and your SSD, your, your SAD will remain constant. And then you put a chamber at 20 centimeters, but still your chamber is remain at the access center of the other machine. So then you can do these two reading and then you can do the TPR 20 and then whatever the 10, the ratio of this one give you the, um, uh, the beam quality of the, of the machine. So other one, why do not correct the effective point of measurement? Oh yeah, this is good. Absolute reference asymmetry, reference asymmetry in both doesn't, does not know. Okay, so the what happened actually, um, very good question. This is a very good set question. Thank you, Asad. Uh, <coughs> we do not correct for the factor point of measurement because what, when, when the, the, the beam quality factors, which they have calculated in TRS-398 and TG-51, the table which I showed you, are if you are doing a direct beam calibration from your SSDL, RPSDL lab, they don't, they already account this correction of effective point of measurement in their KQQ naught. 
are k q are a beam quality factors so do, you don't have to correct it again if you do a correct again then it will be double dip and then you're you're you you you're not doing the right thing basically so that's what the it's already included this correction in your beam quality factor so then you don't have to do it again so good lots of people are actually uh, know that we should be doing in an absolute and a reference dosimetry very good number reference chamber used to correct dose fluctuations dose rate fluctuations voltage fluctuation change correct change col collection charge collection sorry okay so this is basically uh is actually you because whatever happened when you're putting your reference chamber, you just want to make sure that your machine is consistently responding at the same. And there is a very good paper recently published by uh, Canadian medical physics community. They talk about what are the, for example, you are doing a three measurements for your absolute reference dosimetry. So what will happen? So you get the first reading and you get the second reading and you get the third reading. And these readings should have not more than 0.3% in the difference. That's what the recommendation in the uh, maximum difference, they can go up to 0 0.3, but normally it should be less than 0.1% in, in, in two reading or three reading, whatever you're getting it. So the standard deviation of three readings shouldn't be more than 0 0.3 in max, but in reality, normally you get around 0.1% accurately so what you do actually when you run through it's good to warm up your machine properly and then you do your readings and also do your warm-up for the chamber as well and then settle down leave it the chamber for at least like, at least 30 30 minutes for the normal recommendation but normally in clinical environment we don't have 30 minutes to do that actually so the best thing is what you should do you should do in the initial setup do the second one and and at the end of the measurements, you should be compare all three reading and took the average of it, then it will be almost the same. So which value we use to calculate the polarity effect? Okay, yes, anyone knows that. Positive voltages plus M, negative voltages, voltages used in the routine. Uh, I think that's right, in some sense is right, but depends which voltages your chamber is calibrated at SSDL lab. For example, your chamber, you send your chamber and you told them that my central electrode voltages should be minus 300 when you're doing your calibrations. So then you should be using um, this one as a routine routine one, whatever the minus 300, R is a plus 300, depends what you, you what your chamber is calibrated from your PSDL yes. lab. It doesn't matter where it's what you you are using it, but in your department you say minus three hundred. Sorry. Okay. Do you, do you think we should have different calibration factor for each photon energy, like six, eighteen, ten? Yes. No. Don't know. Okay. So yes means. Okay, interesting. <laughs> because what happened? You should be not worrying about that. In reality, in theoretical sense, your beam quality factor is already accounted. Um, your, your beam quality, sorry, the, the calibration factor should be constant for both. Either you're using 6 MeV, uh, 6 MV, or you're using 18 MV or 20 MV, whatever. Your and the WQ naught factor will be remain constant. It will be not changed because this is the cobalt 60 beam quality. So when you're using a 6 MB, then you what you do actually, you correct for beam quality, your KQQ naught are direct beam calibration. If you're doing a direct beam calibration, you should be correcting for KQ. So it already accounted in the in the your beam effect, uh, the beam beam energy effect, because in 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 your beam quality factors you shouldn't be using you know. So that's what it means. 
you should be using a one single beam quality factor for all the energies, okay? So which value of electrometer we should we use to do MV2? So zero volt, low voltages, high voltages. I'll leave it to you guys to think about. <laughs> Read through. Okay. So I have also, I said, I have also asked a lots of questions during the um, presentation. If these, if anyone would like to send these answers to me, uh, my email address, I think so I have shared, I can share it in the, um, in the comments as well. So let's see my comment. Uh, Dot emit. Uh, sir, I have a question uh, from your uh, slide 13, uh, slide number 13, in which you have shown the phantom and uh, there is a reference chamber in the phantom. So yep. what does that mean that uh, during the absolute dosimetry, we have to place reference chamber as well in the water? Yeah, this is what the question uh, Asad has asked us actually, because what I do actually, for example, you are measuring your output. So if your signal is, is actually, we, we, actually, we usually uh, place the chamber in air uh, in this diagram, it was shown in the water. That's what confusing me. It doesn't matter where, where wherever you put it. It's it's just uh, to to see if the system is behaving all right. Okay. It doesn't matter where you put him. I put it normally. Recommendation is you put it under the knee because it doesn't perturb your beam. Because if it is coming, if you put in the in the way of the beam, so what it do actually you is 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 affect your signal. Okay. So is there any uh, suggested depth in which we have to place inside the chamber or inside the phantom? Sorry? Uh, is there any recommended depth uh, which we have to place in the phantom? At least five centimeter away from the reference chamber. Okay. Yeah, where, where the, your, your field chamber should be, uh, sorry, your, your field chamber should be five centimeter away from your reference chamber. Your reference chamber shouldn't be in the way, in, in, very close to the field chamber. Because it, it, if it is close to the field chamber, that what it do actually, it's, uh, it produce the signal which is the backscatter and the scatter condition will change. So then it you, you get a little, it, it's, it's not a big difference. It didn't produce too much difference, but it's good to, why not if you can eliminate the error? So why not? So hopefully I answered you.